Okay, let's have a moment of silence for one of the best, if not the best, superhero show of all time. Alright, the purpose of the study is not just to jizz all over Daredevil, but to examine how it portrays faith and religious identity on a narrative level. In other words, it's not about my dumb opinion, but my equally dumb desire to show why, say it with me kids, sociology's fun. How predictable. <laughs> Marvel's Netflix Daredevil is comprised of three seasons and an appearance in a spin-off show, The Defenders, all of which are helmed by multiple different showrunners, therefore its central themes and concepts don't flow straightforwardly. So in order to frame this dumb video cohesively, I'm going to use the concern of religious identity as a consistent analytical interest, you know, something uh, as a through line. As a result, to begin, there's a few arguments and terms I'm going to explain so I don't sound like I'm talking gibberish. What is religion? Anthony Giddens argued it is a cultural system of commonly shared beliefs and rituals that provide a sense of ultimate meaning and purpose by creating an idea of reality that is sacred, all-encompassing and supernatural. However, after the Industrial Revolution, something changed. Power and influence was given to the individual. Something as simple as the increase of literacy rate led to people recognizing whenever the church deviated from original religious doctrines. Consequently, religious faith slowly became more privatized, individualized and disassociated from organized institutions. Subsequently, Robert Bella called this the rise of Shi'ism, where religious belief can exist in a bottom-up way, centered on personal experience. As I quote from Sheila, the lady that this term was coined from, I believe in God. I'm not a religious fanatic, I can't remember the last time I went to church. My faith has carried me a long way, it's Shi'ism just my own little voice. Daredevil does actually go to church and follow much more conventional practices, but he follows the notion, this DIY approach to religious meaning, where his Catholicism is used as a resource for constructing his personal identity. So, you know, keep this in mind. I designed this rhyme to remind- So the purpose of this essay is to see what kind of meaning can we draw from if we contextualize the show story and this. Whatever, it's very loose. I've, I've never done so many seasons of a show in one video, so... Uh, uh. This is the part where it long meets reality. Season 1 is comprised of 13 episodes and is structured like an extended movie with distinct acts. The first episode opens with his origins, but not through his perspective. Instead, we follow his father as he discovers the aftermath of an accident where his son had saved an old man from a truck carrying chemicals, only to be blinded by it himself. Your boy, he pushed me out of the way. He saved my life. I'm dead. I'm both birds. Then we're reintroduced to Matt Murdock as an adult in a confession booth, tearfully reflecting on his father, admiring his skill as a boxer who can receive loads of hits and enter a trance-like state where he can beat someone like he's got the devil in him. A feeling he couldn't relate to until now. I didn't understand it. What he was feeling deep inside, I, I didn't understand it. Not back then. Afterwards, he asks for forgiveness for his planned vigilante actions, where he stops a human trafficking operation. And finally, before the intro begins, it holds on a full 11 seconds of just him pummeling Turk, even though he's completely defeated. As a result, there's an ambiguity to Matt's nature that's introduced here. He's a good man with instincts to help others, but he's also attracted to violence. Therefore, it's somewhat hard to be entirely sure if his faith and vigilante acts comes from a sincere place, or it's merely unconscious decoration for his more masochistic urges. Charlie Cox himself has said that Matt himself doesn't know this. I think it's. I think the truth is it's complicated. I'm talking about whether he enjoys it or whether he doesn't. Um, and and the the truth is I think he does and he doesn't. Figuring out what that line is is both um, an incredibly scary prospect for him. Um, and and I think he I think 
he probably has never quite asked himself that question entirely because he, he he's afraid of what the answer might be. As a result, Daredevil is a deconstruction of the expected violence in the superhero genre by suggesting that it's not just a means to an end, but it's actually the result of a deeply flawed and disturbed worldview. The first three episodes trains the audience to overlook all of this by providing clear moral lines and very comfortable cliches. Matt and Foggy are two young bright buddies starting up their own law firm to help the con folk, while an evil criminal conspiracy looms over and their first client becomes their secretary and best friend. I did notice that you could use some help around here and I, I owe you. Furthermore, Matt himself is established to be very deeply morally confident and uncompromising. When they're looking for a new office, they get into an argument over what qualifies as innocent. And my partner fails to recognize that as defense attorneys, we're never going to be able to keep the lights on waiting on a horde of innocent souls to stumble into our loving arms. When he's defending Kingpin's hitman, he draws a distinction between the objective record versus how we interpret it. These questions of good and evil, as important as they are, have no place in a court of law. Only the facts matter. In light of this, we will be pursuing damages. Damages? You released sensitive information regarding- The only person I ever told anything to was my doctor. <sighs> a man is dead. And my client, John Healy, took his life. Therefore, the contradiction between Matt's occupation as a lawyer and his activities as a vigilante stems from his impotence. And I'm not talking about his boner, but he doesn't feel effective as a representative of morality. He feels more like he's just merely a manager of bureaucracy. Justice cannot take root in mid rage. We must dissent from the indifference. We must dissent from the apathy. We must descend from the fear. So being a vigilante is more or less him fixing this deficiency. Although it's still kind of messed up because he doesn't only act as daredevil as a response to the failure of the system, he actively goes searching for the opportunity to beat people. As Foggy said, But to do what you do, you had to keep training, knowing you would do something like this. Maybe it isn't only about justice, Matt. Maybe it's about you having an excuse to hit someone. Maybe you just can't stop yourself. I don't want to stop. Act 2 episodes 4 through 9 challenges Matt's position and forces the audience to confront the lack of moral clarity with Willie Fisk. I would appreciate if you don't call me Willie anymore. He's a simple and efficient man. He makes omelets, wears the same clothes all the time, speaks some pretty terrible Mandarin. Should seem like but when he looks in the mirror, he only sees a child. Willie is like a cracked reflection of Matt, with an inverted origin. Matt's father was a boxer who would be beaten in fixed fights regularly. And then he died in defiance to ensure his son could grow up out of poverty, alongside with pride in his own name and to have dignity. What else are you gonna leave him when you're gone? Just once. I want Matty to hear people cheer for his old man. Therefore, Matt idolizes his father's ability to receive pain in an almost fetishistic way. And it's one of the reasons why the hallway scene is so dope. It galvanizes this entire theme and puts it on display. But Willie's dad was a dude running for Willie office. Anymore. He forced his son to be present when he beat his mother, and he taught him to inflict pain onto others whenever he feels insecure. As a result, Willie treats violence as a necessary part of his political plans in order to defy his father's indulgence in it. Don't give me that look like your mother you do what i tell you kick him kick him that's why i still wear these to remind myself that i'm not cruel for the sake of cruelty that i'm not my father and like matt he wants to save hell's kitchen but he ends up doing it in the most cruelest way possible where he buys all the properties kicks out the poor people and works with criminals to terrorize everyone else his machiavellian scheming is as a result kind of paradoxical he tries not to be like his father but he ends up being just as manipulative and malicious how much are each of those years worth to you in round figures both Matt and Willie's entry into adulthood is shaped by their father's relationship with violence. They're both men trapped as boys, repeating their father's actions, if you will. And the symmetry ends up artistically casting doubt over Matt's moral position because you realize he's just as emotionally inhibited as Willie. This is emphasized by the fact that Matt also wants to just straight up kill Willie because his ability to manipulate records and hide his crime makes him completely untouchable through the law. What happened to all that talk about going after him through the system? Sometimes the law isn't enough. 
Act 3 of the last episodes, 10 through 13, and it returns to Foggy, who after loads of arguing, forces Matt to rebalance his conscience, so it includes the law again. How do I stop him? By using the law, Matt. Like you told me and Karen to do. That's how we take him down. Which is a fun sort of switcheroo because Foggy was introduced to be someone who's more interested in money and Matt was his conscience, but now it's flipped. Therefore, with their rediscovered partnership as Daredevil, Matt saves Detective Hoffman and together they defeat Willie through traditional legal procedures. Turn yourself into Brett Mahoney. You can trust him. And he has a couple of lawyers that can't be bought. They can help you. Is a synthesis of methods, if you will. Therefore, Matt Murdock arcs ends with him adapting his nature as his father's son with the man he grew up to be. The devil and the lawyer becomes the judge. Whereas Willie embraces his role as a villain. Like his father, his last gasp of freedom before he's thrown away involves an all-out assault. And when he's smashing Daredevil, it resembles the way his father smashed his mother. And he declares his hatred of the city and resentment over everyone around him. <laughs> The season started with people trying to find order in a chaotic world, but ends with everyone embracing a bit of chaos to reassert balance. Matt's relationship with his faith is very similar to Peter Berger's early Sacred Canopy work, where he argued religion had adapted to fulfilling therapeutic needs in private life. Although granted, this quote is part of Peter Berger's early secularization thesis work, where he argued organized church had adopted a consumer focus in order to stay relevant, but the point is, Matt's Catholicism is a protective shell that preserves his moral values in the face of his own killer urges. His phrase, the devil in him, doesn't just refer to him being a crazy asshole, but its religious meaning that allows him to contextualize and recognize his own fallibility and remind him to put limits on his own instincts. Because you're insane. <laughs> Season 2 moves Matt's relationship with violence away from his father and points it towards himself, using the Punisher and Electra. I know you. No, you don't. You don't. Not anymore. Unlike season 1, season 2 is not structured as a 13 hour long film, but more like 3 4 to 5 hour long movies. Episodes 1 through 4 is focused on the Punisher vs Daredevil. Frank Castle is a vigilante who lost his family from criminals and is on a similar crime fighting mission, but his involves sniper rifles. Therefore, thematically, Frank questions the legitimacy and effectiveness of Matt's hey, mission. Hey, you know it. Only I do the one thing that you can't. You hit him and they get back up, I hit him and they stay down. It's permanent. Which on one hand is kind of unreasonable to murder everyone, but the idea that Matt is knowingly fighting a never-ending war does feed into the conceit that he might be possibly doing all of this to feed his addiction for violence, his restricted darkness. However, right now, the point of the Punisher is not to weaken Matt's position, but to strengthen in it. Daredevil defends his morals, calls Frank insane for not believing in redemption, and due to his faith in the law, he doesn't take credit for his defeat, therefore ensuring vigilantism isn't further endorsed. Punisher, effectively right now, represents the success of Daredevil. <laughs> The second film is episodes 5 through 8, which focuses on Frank's trial, but due to Electra, everything goes wrong. Is it the place or, or is it- It's definitely not you. Electra was Matt's university love. Ten years ago, while crashing a rich ball party, he was drawn to her, and before he was nearly kicked out, she saves him. He's with me. Excuse me. She knows he's looking for excitement, and he figures out she's someone so rich that she's trapped by boredom. As a result, she loves him because he cares, and he loves her because she doesn't. I do, I get you. Get me. And it's through this relationship, she teaches him to stop learning to live with pain and reconnect with the passionate needs of his own body. Not just in terms of sex, but inflicting and receiving pain himself to feel alive. However, this goes way too far. Electra kidnaps the dude behind Matt's father's death and tries to push him into murder, which is what leads to their original split. I can't, I can't, I can't do that. We can do anything together. No, I can't. Electra represents both the romance and consequences of surrendering to want. However, it's through recognizing what he wants that Matt grows the most. Before her death, Matt for the first time plans to leave Hell's Kitchen with her. Wherever you run, I run with you. 
You're not serious. I've never been more serious. Electra, this is a part of me that I need. And you're the only one who gets it. Without this, I'm not alive. I'm not, not really. And I know that now, thanks to you. She's someone that draws Matt away from the narrow path of his father. Consequently, Frank and Electra are existential challenges for Matt. They challenge how confidently he sees himself, how much he trusts the legitimacy of his own identity. There is goodness in people, even in you. And you're gonna have to kill me because I'm never gonna stop coming for you. You act like you have some window into my soul, but you don't. And there's always this glorious darkness inside you. Subsequently, Matt's love for Electra is like an addiction, his life without restraints, but due to his self-imposed limits, he's not Frank. So which one is truly him? The answer is both, and the answer is neither. As Foggy says, You don't get to create danger and then protect us from that danger. That's not heroic. That's insane. The last arc, episodes 9 through 13, features Daredevil, Stick, and Elektra fighting the hand. And there's not much to talk about because, thanks to Jeff Loeb, Nobu's entire backstory was completely cut, declaring no one cares about Asians. The character just literally walked out of shadows, threatened people, killed people, walked back into shadows, and was dispatched up quickly four times. There was a previous storyline that, uh, that, that many of the writers who I, I adore, I adore, I love them. They uh, gave me privy to a storyline that was supposed to go, they had planned for months to, to, to write and implement into shooting, but uh, they were prevented. I'm kind of reluctant to say this, but I'm going to take it. Jeff Loeb told the writer's room not to write for Nobu and Gal. And this was reiterated many times by many of the writers and showrunners. The showrunners said, uh, nobody cares about Chinese people and Asian people. Previous Marvel movies, a trilogy called Blade that was made where Wesley Snipes kills 200 Asians each movie. Nobody gives a shit, so don't write about Nobu and Gal. And they were forced to put their storyline down and drop it. I have privy to that storyline because he explained it to me. And they were very apologetic that they couldn't follow through with it, but they were their hands were tied. It was very interesting storyline about um, about having uh, to, to, to go there under the guise of uh, getting a, a transplant. And it was medical reasons. And a lot of paperwork and bureaucracy was fudged so that Nobu can get into the uh, the, the, the country and then, uh, and then carry out his Black Sky plans. But all that backstory was dropped. And the writers told me that they, they regretted and they were reluctant to do it because they were so stoked about including that in the storyline, but they were prevented. Furthermore, Nobu was supposed to be the main villain in The Defenders, but was displaced by Scorny Weaver eating food for a whole season. As a result, with this cut importance, we know nothing about him or his plans. So the stakes feel really superficial and we don't know how he relates with Matt's relationship with violence, so it doesn't deepen the theme of the story and yeah. Thanks, Jeff. But it's not all bad, if you're willing to squint. The last few episodes is all about destiny. Matt pushes Foggy away, closing their firm. If I'm holding you back, then you should consider closing the office for good. He pushes Electro away. We have to stop corrupting each other. And because he's fighting an ancient ninja organization, he doesn't have the law on his side in any way, only his violent instincts. We need to tell the police. Tell them what? I killed a member of an ancient organization of ninjas that was out digging a giant hole in midtown Manhattan. As a result, there's a prevailing feeling of inevitability here. Like everyone is torn away from familiar grounds and is forced to follow their nature. They don't get to tell you what you are. But you said the same thing. Well, I was wrong. No one gets to tell you. That's it. You're dead to me. Do you hear me? I'm already dead. Frank knows he's been exploited by the Kingpin into killing his prison rival to be set free and wipe out his other competitions, but he just can't stop himself. Every time he tries to deviate from his own nature, it fails, leading to the climax where he kills his own former army buddies because they were involved with his family's death. Electra similarly tries to stop getting her jollies from murdering people, but she can't. It's the only thing that makes her feel alive. Your adrenaline spiked, Electra. You enjoy killing. And then she finds out that she's the Black Sky, whatever that means. For Matt, he becomes all devil and no lawyer. He concedes with Frank's desire to kill, which ironically leads Frank to become more protective of Matt's innocence and becomes a slightly more morally cooperative vigilante. At least it's hinted at anyways. See you around, Red. 
Furthermore, Matt reunites with Electra with a renewed sense of loyalty. He refuses to let her destiny as the Black Sky determine her future. It's like he swings completely in the other direction now. But then the Hand sets up a really goofy plan to lure Matt out using hostages. As he argues, I'll be damned if I'm not getting them out. It's the wrong play. It's the only play. And their rescue mission leads to Electra trying to save Matt but dying herself. However, she dies with a smile as she's beaten her destiny. I know now what it feels to be good. While Matt is filled with rage. Their dream of freedom is squashed by his destiny. Therefore, if the first season was about Matt reconciling with himself, season two is about him losing such reconciliation. For whatever it's worth, I'm glad you're here. What? The Defenders is the second half of Matt's collapse. When we see him again, he's out of focus in his apartment as his braille is being printed. Matt hears a crime but doesn't act. Instead, he waits and hears the police arrive instead. So he's no longer Daredevil, just a lawyer. A very, very aggressive lawyer who specifically highlights the Defendants' wrongdoing and willfully ignoring the truth. What would you say is worse? Ignoring data in the interest of cutting costs, or neglecting to supply the court with records that might prove you purposely put people in danger, including Your this Honor. young man, including this young man, Aaron James, Your who Honor. might never walk again. Your Honor, we would like a As a result, on one hand, Matt has become the man he always wanted to be. He originally left his corporate law firm to precisely protect people from them. But on the other hand, what he criticizes the defendant can be applied to himself because by not doing more than he can, he's being dishonest with himself. Matt has overcorrected his life so much that he doesn't enjoy it anymore, as he explains to Father Lantum. Well, I'm trying very hard to ignore my soul. The Defenders is eight episodes, and it flows like a movie. Episodes one through three comprises act one, and it follows all the characters in their separate corners of New York, following individual cases, which all eventually merge very, 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 very slowly. Um, I mean, we're gonna need a juice bar, uh, standing desk. However, act two, episode Episodes 4 through 6 is when the magic really happens. Stig cuts off his rubber hand and everyone are forced to work together out of necessity. Sorry, this is a mistake. I gotta go. I can't be a part of this. If you ask me, you already are. Matt is the most reluctant member at first, even more so than Jessica Jones for the reason that his last team up originally ended with Electra dying and that was the most painful experience he's ever had. You calm down, Luke. You don't get second chances with these people, right? If you're not careful, the next thing you know, you're, you're dead. Or worse, you're holding the people you love the most in the world and you get the, you get the privilege of watching them die. Although he still ends up sticking around, every member of the Defenders draws something very different out of Matt. Jessica Jones is kind of like a kindred spirit, someone fighting their own nature and is trapped by a history of regrets because of someone who had power over them. So she implicitly forces him to review his life. You know, Lexi, you remind me of a friend of mine. His dad was a boxer. Luke and Danny are younger forces that draw out his old youthful determination and sense of responsibility, especially Danny. I mean, come on, look, I even put on a tie. I promise you, you cannot fight these people, not even with whatever it is your hand can do. Therefore, as Matt reluctantly participates, he's kind of forced to reinvest into his own life again, to care again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially as he grows closer with Jessica. Although there's still a sense of inevitability lingering over from season two, Electra is all black sky now and none of her original self anymore. She follows her fading memories of Matt to not be alone, but that's it. She kills Sigourney Weaver, she kills Dick, and she ultimately leads the hand. The destiny she once fought has won. Truth is, I've never felt more home, more alive than right now. Furthermore, despite how Matt involves himself in the team, he still holds on to his secret with Electra for as long as possible, which feeds into his disinterest with committing with his life again, leading to Act 3, Episode 7 through 8. He totally wants to blow up a building to wipe out the hand, which is pretty out of character, but I think that's kind of the point. Detonating a bomb here won't fix what happened to him. No, but it might help everyone else who will be in danger. He didn't kill largely because he believed in redemption, as he explained to Frank earlier, but now he stopped. He himself couldn't change. Maybe even evil, but had one small piece of goodness in him. I lied to someone. To someone I love. Do you miss it? I told her I didn't. I like this one. Sign that your mind and your soul are not yet aligned. So I guess you can totally make an exception. Again. In the end, he has a last gasp of life with his new colleagues.
but it's life that's nothing in comparison to moments with Electra. So after the big fight, he tells them to leave, promising that he'll meet them later, but he also whispers protect my city to Danny as he stays behind with Electra. He tries to convince her and gives her the opportunity to live the dream they once shed tears over, but that's no longer an option. The hand did not reduce me to this. This is who I've always been. You forget. I know when you're lying. Her only interest is to die again, but with Matt, so she won't have to face death alone again. Therefore, Matthew fights her with no hope of surviving, but with also a big smile. We can have this forever. He wants this too. If he can't be with her in life, then dying with her is much better than returning to life without her again. So they hold each other as they're consumed by dust, and Foggy and Karen finally face the day where they don't see their friend again. But how I know that the things she brought out of me were wrong. I'm alone in the world, Matthew. Do you know what that feels like? Hey, I've never been further north than 116th Street, so... Because you love New York. I mean, I give my life for it, but there's one thing in this world that makes me feel more alive. And that's you, Electra, this is a part of me that I need. And what about the kids? What are we going to do with them? And you're the only one who gets it. Without this, I'm not alive. I'm not, not really. Let's go to London. Yeah? I'm going to die here. That's what anything feels like. Daredevil Season 2 and The Defenders are basically two parts of the same story, the dark second act of his journey. At first, it moves Matt's moral goalposts so quietly and subtly with Frank and Electra that he doesn't have it anymore. So, when he's with Danny, Jessica and Luke, they all visibly show how much he's fallen, so when it does happen at the end, there's an oddly cathartic feel to it. In fact, please smile. There. Season 3 opens with Matt, and instead of being obliterated by the explosion or crushed to death by the catacombs, he's thrown out into the sewers. Makes perfect sense. Afterwards, he's brought back to his childhood church, dazed by his memories of Electra. He tries to stand but falls into his mother's arms as his heightened senses are blocked by blood. So figuratively, he can't see, as he once did when he first lost his sight. I can't see. I can't see. Daredevil Season 3 is insanely clever for the reason that it makes a story out of tidying everything from before. It focuses on Matt unlearning the violence that once defined him, rekindling his innocence and confronting the question established all the way back in the very first episode. What's more important for Matt, his addiction to violence or his morals? Showrunner Eric Olsen describes the main theme of the season is fear. One of the other guiding principles for the season was the idea of fear, the notion that our fears enslave us, that every single character sitting on this stage has some sort of a fear that is driving their behavior, because that speaks to the larger world in which we live, in which people behave certain ways, and that there are tyrants and narcissistic personality types that kind of can pit people against each other using fear and rise to power on the backs of that. So that became kind of the guiding principle for the season. Furthermore, he iterated that all the characters represented different forces that are important in fighting against fear as a social weapon. Uh, and in the case of season three, it was the power of the free press by Karen, the power mm -hmm. of, of the law, Foggy and Mad, and then of course the power of collective action together, including Daredevil, they're able to take down Wilson Fisk. So let's get into all the characters. First, we have a new POV character, Willie's FBI handler, Ray Nadim, who is a simple family man with good intentions, worthy of a promotion, but due to his various financial problems, is inhibited. My courageous sister-in-law is now 100% cancer-free. <laughs> You're denying me the advancement opportunities that I have rightfully earned. It's bureau policy not to promote someone with that level of vulnerability. We know it hasn't been easy for you. Being denied insurance over and over again. My sister-in-law was sick and I... And I am sorry for that. Three and a half years. You two did the work. I just wrote a few checks. You're not getting another job. We've been down this road before. I know, Ray. I can't see another way out. I'll fix this. But when Willie starts cooperating, which furthers his career, it's also revealed that Willie had actually penetrated the entire FBI's upper head, setting the entire situation up artificially. I don't believe it. Fisk got something on all of you? We only refer to him by his code name, Kingpin. 
Therefore, Ray is dragged to the top of Willie's corrupt inner circle. Fear for his family, career, and inability to fight back against the entire system is what keeps him in line. However, he ends up getting in the way of Karen's assassination and in doing so, made him an enemy. And through his confession and eventual death, he's the one that brings down Fisk. You're telling me this is, this is admissible in court? Every damn word. It's the silver bullet to take down Fisk. Nadim's actor, Jay Alley, considers Ray as an avatar for the real life everyman. Uh, Ray Nadim represents what? The average American. Therefore, his arc represents the capacity for the ordinary person to transcend fear and defeat the establishment by taking responsibility. Please give me a moment to say goodbye to my wife. Did you get one to rain a dean? Please! In contrast, his buddy, Ben Pointexter, is corrupted, reshaped, and redefined because of his fear. The FBI, the army before that, they helped keep me on the straight and narrow path. But now, Without that, it's all, uh, I'm drowning in deep water and I, I don't know whether I'm swimming for the surface or the bottom. Willie <sighs> takes advantage of the limits of his mind. Dex is diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and psychopathy. When he was a wee lad and an orphan, he practiced his aim every day and eventually killed his coach. Therefore, his therapist taught him to follow a North Star or role model so he understands how to perform in society and avoid his violent urges. Let me ask you a question, Craig. This asshole stepdad of yours has given you so much grief. Why not? Take a deep breath, Craig. I'm not going anywhere. Willie kills Dex's original North Star, Julie, in order to groom him. And like his own father before him, he teaches Dex to indulge in his own cruelty to overcome his insecurities. As a result, he becomes Willie's personal weapon in his operations and becomes the new Daredevil. Hello, Karen. It's nice to see you again. Therefore, there's two ways to interpret his presence. On one hand, in this season, this perversion of Matt's persona externalizes the very perversion he's enacting on himself. I am what I do in the dark now. I bleed only for myself. As he regains his senses, he has no interest in returning to life as Matt Murdock or Daredevil. He's only interested in his search for violence. But on a broader level, it's a moment of reflection. The Daredevil persona became a monstrous addiction by the end of his life, to the extent that the idealistic romanticism it originated from became kind of ironic. Therefore, by putting on display the monster Matt became, he's forced to restore who he is as a response. He isn't the real Daredevil. How do you know? Because he is. However, Matt's arc has kind of reset itself. He's back to being obsessed with killing Willie. But without Foggy or his faith, this struggle interrogates him on a much more deeper level. Would you be honest with yourself? You put on that mask because it lets you feel all right with who you really are. It lets you hurt people. It makes you feel like it's for something important, something, something good, good, maybe, maybe even, even for, for God. God. <sighs> but that ain't the truth. We both know it. You and your father cut from the same cloth. A corrupt boxer who takes the most satisfaction in inflicting pain as he does money for taking dives. And his son, who's trying to convince himself he's any better than his criminal father. Both Matt and Dex are effectively dark inversions of each other, an empathetic person who tries to be cold and emotionless, and a cold, emotionless person who tries to be empathetic. Everything is effectively performative, and everything is the result of them being unable to forgive themselves and go home. Subsequently, home is waiting. Home is still there. Okay, I'll help you, Dex. I know it's irrational. It's not dead. Karen literally protects Matt's apartment, paying his bills and regularly visiting with the hope that one day he'd reappear. Karen is a bit of a wacky character. Originally, she wasted her life with her boyfriend while her family was under financial troubles. The diner has been failing for years and you won't admit it. You just keep clinging to it because you think mom's gonna find her way back here somehow. Her brother then enrolled her into university, but because she ran away and caused a spat between her brother and her boyfriend, he dies and the entire family falls apart. Therefore, she's defined by her buried sins and her need to believe that there's no limits to second chances. This is what made her initially attracted to Matt because 
even when the evidence was stacked against her, he still believed in her. Her relationship with Ben Urich came from a shared sense of justice for uncovering hidden sins. She believed in Frank's redemption even when he didn't. Frank! You do this and you are the monster that they say you are, do you hear me? And when Matt retired as Daredevil, she was the only one there for him. As a result, Karen is like a beacon of light throughout the entirety of the show, someone who shows that searching for truth is in itself a form of atonement, if you will. I killed myself. In addition, Foggy has a similar role. He was Matt's conscience from the beginning. There were university roommates that shared a strong connection with their home in Hell's Kitchen. You're not from Hell's Kitchen, are you? Yeah, born and raised. So am I! Yeah, I heard about you when you were a kid. What you did, saving that guy across the street? And they left their original firm together to take the risk and help the little guy. And it's through his influence that Matt originally was able to withdraw himself from his violent addictions and strive for something greater. How do I stop him? By using the law, Matt. Like you told me and Karen to do. Subsequently in this season, he stands up to Fisk by putting himself in the open to descend from the apathy, indifference and fear, as Matt used to say in pressure foggy to doing. Not Marshall. We must descend from the indifference. We must descend from the apathy. We must descend from the fear. Yeah, I know. You've read it a million times. The man is locked up in FBI custody 24 hours a day. In a five-star hotel. Because he made a deal with the feds. Living in luxury as long as he gives up major underworld figures. Which Fisk has done time and again, making this city safer. Or making his competition disappear. Therefore, both Karen and Foggy provide Matt with a continuity that stretches beyond the one violent one that Electra drew out. And they're just awesome characters. And it's, just, it's great, it's great. Consequently, Matt's entire arc is built around him coming home. He never wears his red sunglasses anymore, so he literally doesn't see the world in a rose-tinted way, but through deceiving others into thinking he's something he's not. A man who can see, and a man who doesn't care. But deep down inside, the little kid who went out to save an old man is still there. When push comes to shove, he saves Karen as opposed to kill Wilson. When he discovers Sister Maggie was his mother, he learns to forgive her. And when he finally has the opportunity to kill Willie, he doesn't. He declares, But you don't get to destroy who I am! Ironically, it's Matt's natural guilt that saves him, his capacity to recognize that he's more than his violent desires. He can feel more than pain. As a result, he makes a deal with Willie, embracing his original path as the devil who keeps people on the straight and narrow, while Willie himself was also a man looking to go home, back to Vanessa. However, she's also his weakness. She was the one that ordered Ray Nadim's death, therefore making his confession completely invincible. This season is about rebirth, and it's the Find as a product of taking personal responsibility in the face of overwhelming fear. To be brave enough to forgive and see the possibilities of being a man without fear. Being a man without fear is being a man of forgiveness, to forgive others and more importantly to forgive yourself. It's a form of responsibility that exists personally and collectively. Consequently, with this lesson, Matt, Foggy and Karen then start again, with plans to restore the old firm and use their new experiences to make it work this time. Matt doesn't quite return to his old self, you can sense a level of jadedness to him, but that also means he's progressed. His optimism in the end is not informed by faith, but by experience. God's plan is like a beautiful tapestry. And the tragedy of being human is that we only get to see it from the back. Did you want me to convince you? Of what? This. Us, you know, giving Nelson and Murdoch another shot. I was hoping you would. Relieved when you didn't. With all the ragged threads and the muddy colors, and we only get a hint at the true beauty that would be revealed if we could see the whole pattern on the other side. As God does. I realized that if my life had turned out any differently, that I would never have become Daredevil. And although people have died on my watch, people who shouldn't have, there are countless others that have lived. You have a generous heart, Matthew. <gasps> to see the good in so much pain. Not always. 
Matt's religious identity is like a ping pong game throughout the show. It's the home that shaped him, the home he leaves, and the home he returns to after he was wounded from his journey of love. Subsequently, Matt's black and white morals can't survive without his faith because it's what regulates him. It makes him convinced that doing the right thing extends beyond the confines of both bureaucratic law and his own enjoyment with hitting people. It's a resource for him to make meaning, if you will. When we're introduced to Matt as an adult, he's in the confession booth with Father Lentum. At the end of the show, he delivers delivers a sermon at his funeral. It's a continuity that always remains throughout the up and downs, regardless. As a result, out of all the Netflix Marvel shows, Daredevil got pretty much the luckiest finale, where Iron Fist just straight up ended with a cliffhanger. Jessica Jones left on a pretty miserable note. Punisher kind of worked, but also it's a bit irritating because we see him finally become the Punisher for the third time in a row. And Luke Cage kind of worked if you're into really ambiguous and dark endings. But yeah, in Daredevil, if you ignore the bullseye tease, it's pretty much a perfect loop, with 90% of all the major loose ends closed, and are even given spectacular payoffs. However, what were the plans for season four? Remember, there was some question here about Owsley and the mention of he has a son in season one. And that was, in fact, we were setting up the, uh, the owl from uh, from the comics, who was out for revenge of, for what happened to his father. I was building on that in season four. Oh, fantastic, yeah. What I will say is that season four, um, um, I was going to hopscotch. I was not gonna directly pick up the bullseye storyline because his back was broken mm -hmm. and he had to heal. I was gonna bring him back to season five, is right. what Logan and I figured out. Uh, season four was going to be Typhoid Mary, Alice Eve. You know, I, I, I had a different version. I had a much different version of her than what Raven had done with, in Iron Fist, mm -hmm. but I, I was kind of rebooting what she was going to be like. And we were going to do a, a warped love story, murder mystery kind of femme fatale we'd broken it. We'd broken more or less the entire season when we got canceled. So so uh, um, that was um, heartbreaking. Owsley was going to be one of the, the key figures. So so we had a, uh, a really intense but different kind of season. I didn't want to just do season three again. Yeah. I didn't think I was going to be able to, to pull that off, honestly. Like, yeah, I had to to take a, a different tack. Then I was gonna plan for season five for how that would all kind of come back together, but yeah. Thank you to everyone on Patreon. My channel completely imploded into itself this month. So you guys really are the best. And I'll hang out with you all later on Discord. Avocados at law. Incident. Is that what we're calling it now? Well, it sounds so much better than death and destruction raining from the sky, nearly wiping Hell's Kitchen off the map. Shorter, too. So amazing anyway, but... What he did with me was, this character was just unbelievable. And you butchered it. <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh, to <laughs> My son got to speak to Daredevil on FaceTime. Uh, that's, that's the main thing, so... Uh, you win some, you lose some, you 